Good morning, Kitty. We're going to do this sketch today. This time we're going to use three colors from this Cotman watercolor set. We're going to use ultramarine, alizarin crimson hue, and cadmium yellow hue. Okay, let's get painting. I'm looking to use a combination of warm and cool color mixtures for this particular sketch. Now with these three primary colors, we will be getting three secondary colors. Orange, purple, and green. Because this is a winter scene, we're not going to use any green. We'll stick to purple and orange. Alright, in case you missed the first and second parts of this video series, you should be really watching those first. I pointed out in them that this series is going to focus on the first lesson I learned about visual storytelling. This is not going to be about drawing or painting techniques, although I will talk briefly about the medium I'm using and my sketching process, but we're not going into too much detail on that. We could probably discuss that in a different video series. But for now, we're going to wrap up our discussion on the difference between visual storytelling and visual communication. So in the previous videos, we discussed, based on my experiences and mistakes, that visual storytelling is not the same as visual communication, because they differ in their starting points. And depending on which starting point we choose to take, the creation process can either become exploratory or it can be a long-winded rationalization process for the artist. I learned that visual storytelling is ideal for writing fiction such as literary books and short stories, whereas visual communication is ideal for persuasion, like those you see in advertisements or websites, or most movies these days. When I was in university, College of Fine Arts, and later on in my day job, up until now, I practice a lot of visual communication, because that has practical use for businesses. You could make a case that studying visual communication in university became a barrier to my understanding and appreciation of visual storytelling. And I would agree. My training was focused on prioritizing message over visuals, focusing inward instead of looking at the world outside my head. I had gotten so used to starting off with a message that I assumed that was the correct way to create meaningful art. I was wrong. Again. I had conflated design and art. And knowing how to do good design in my day job does not necessarily translate well when creating art. Okay now, I have to point out the difference between design and art. I was having trouble articulating this, but fortunately I came across a short video of Camille Paglia, the American professor and cultural critic where she defined fine arts. She said, open quote, fine arts means art that is non-utilitarian, for instance, works of painting and sculpture primarily, that are intended for contemplation, as opposed to furniture or a Persian rug or something that has some particular use, end quote. I thought that is exactly what visual storytelling is. Now, before we start seeing straw men, I'm not equating comic books with fine arts. I'm looking at this through the filter of visual storytelling. Visual storytelling has something in common with the fine arts. It has no utilitarian purpose, but people walk away from them in contemplation. I don't see this happening in visual communication, because it has a specific message and an aim to persuade people to agree or disagree with it. You could say visual storytelling starts off seemingly meaningless with just a picture, but it ends in a wellspring of meaning because the artist pursued a vision. On the other hand, while visual communication starts off strong with an explicit message, in the end, it loops back to that same message. There's hardly any room for contemplation. So. You might be wondering, when would this information be useful to differentiate visual storytelling from visual communication? Well, as an artist, it helps me to understand the difference between the two methods so that I can apply them accordingly in my work. My day job will always be confined to visual communication. On the other hand, 
I have to turn off that learned skill when I write my short story comic books, because it's meant to be an exploration of ideas. Now, as a spectator, I think it would be useful to know this difference so that I can detect which is which when I see it, and hopefully I can balance out my exposure to them. Visual storytelling will leave me thinking in ways I wouldn't have expected. Okay, this sketch is almost done. Let me do a quick comment on my paint process in this three color sketch exercise. As I did in the previous sketches, I start off painting the lightest values, the background area first and then on the main subjects. Then I start adding darker values, one color mixture at a time. I then apply the outlines once I'm halfway through the painting. The outlines are usually the darkest value in the sketch, so it helps me gauge how much darker I should make the other areas in comparison to the outlines. Even though I use different colors for the outline on the bears, the fox, and the panel border, they all have the same tonal value, meaning that if this were translated into a one color sketch, those outlines will have the same pigment saturation in them. If you recall our two color sketch, we used yellow ochre and burnt sienna. One is a shade of yellow and the other is a shade of red. So mixing the two will only give us a shade of orange and nothing close to black because we're missing cyan or a shade of it. Now with this three color selection, we can get a black or a very dark color if we mix all three pigments. Since we have a shade of red, yellow and blue. I use this mixture on the bare noses and claws. When I was close to finishing the sketch, I noticed the top portion of the background needed a little bit more contrast, so I added a darker wash over that area. The sun was setting on me in this painting, so I had to turn on my table light here. Among the three media I've used in this video series, watercolor is the most challenging for me. And for that same reason, it's the most fun to use. Alright, this concludes part 3 of this video series. Thank you for your interest in exploring this subject with me. Oh, but before we finish, I have a question for you. What common theme is in the three sketches? I'll give you some time to think. Find out the answer in part 4. See you soon!